Howdy, folks. And it's so good to be here with you once again, at, uh, almost at the end of a week. We're here at the beginning of March, and uh, in these parts where I live, uh, the saying, in with the lion, has certainly been the case. We've had tons of snow. The, the temperature's been kind of good, but uh, nevertheless, lots of snow to shovel. But spring is just around the corner, and we're so looking forward to the change of season. Hope all is well with you. I hope the Lord has blessed you this past week with his presence and his mercy and kindness. And I want to thank you again for inviting me into your spaces and places where you may be hearing this and seeing this or however you're doing it. I appreciate you all and I thank you all and I ask God's blessings on you. So I want to begin by asking you a question about prayer, specifically about you. How is your prayer life? What is your habit of prayer? And honestly, did you pray today? R.C. Sproul, Sproul or Sproul once said, quote, prayer is not optional for the Christian, it is required. Charles Hayden Spurgeon was a 19th century preacher and pastor. His influence and his preaching and his ministry was wide and uh, his influence remains to this day. And Spurgeon is not only remembered for his preaching and his ministry, but also as a man of prayer. And Spurgeon said this about prayer, quote, as well could you expect a plant to grow without air and water as to expect your heart to grow without prayer and faith, end quote. If we look at the Bible, it is filled with the prayers of many people, from Abraham and Moses and King David, the prophets, just to mention a few that you will find in the Old Testament. Many, many more in there. The New Testament brings us to, into intimate contact, contact with the praying Jesus. Jesus praying to his Father for his disciples, even for you and me. Check that out in John's Gospel. Praying to his Father moments before his betrayal and arrest. Father, Jesus teaches us the necessity of prayer. That his followers should always pray and never give up. In the letters of the Apostle Paul throughout the New Testament, we find a model and an example, one who understood that prayer is not optional for Christ, Christian, it is required, as Sproul would say. Then why? Why do we struggle with prayer? Why? Hold that thought. Don't run from it. Let it sink in deep. And as you're thinking about it, consider this. Have you ever heard someone say this about their marriage? We never have had an argument in our marriage. Not one single fight. The first word that comes to mind is impossible. It is impossible to avoid conflict in a marriage. Now, if you're saying to yourself, right now, I don't struggle with prayer prayerlessness, one word comes to mind, impossible. We all struggle with our prayer lives. All means all. Now, author Scott Hubbard, Hubbard, Scott Hubbard, excuse me, said, quote, rarely do I approach a set-aside time of prayer without thinking of at least one reason, and often more than one, to do something else instead. Does that sound familiar? Granted, there are reasons for not praying. For example, sleep. We do need to sleep in order to function. Yet even this can become a reason for not praying. Have you ever said, I need the sleep to excuse yourself from a time of prayer? Or how about, I have too much work to do? Or I need to check my email first? Or I wonder who won the hockey game last night and you zip on your phone there to NHL.com. 
or Sportsnet or TSN or wherever. See, these and other reasons, well, I guarantee you, come our way when we pray. They will come our way. Now, Hubbard comments in an article that he wrote uh, regarding what he calls four lies that hide behind our prayerlessness. One, I don't have time to pray. Two, prayer isn't worth the effort. Three, I can handle today without prayer. And four, God doesn't hear me when I pray. Each of these excuses or lies, as Hubbard would say in his article, uh, uh, Jesus would expose the lie in each of them. That's what Hubbard would say. Now, time's not our friend, so I will leave it here, but the point has been made. Folks, we all struggle with our prayer life, all of us. And we all have our reasons or excuses not to pray. So please turn in your Bibles or your app, Bible app or iPad app or whatever you're using to 1 Timothy. We're going to be in chapter 2. Uh, we went from chapter 1 straight to chapter 3. We completed chapter 3. Now we come back to chapter 2, which we have just begun today. I hope you will eventually see the method to my madness. So chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, verses 1 through 7. Verse 1. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This, is, this has now, pardon me, this has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Verse 7, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald and apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Lord, bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And as we look at this very important subject about prayer and prayerlessness and all that, we ask, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would enlighten our minds. Would you open our ears to the sensitivity of your spirit, may it impact us through and through, not only in our minds and our hearts, but in our hands and feet as well, and in our knees when we pray. And I thank you so much, Lord, for your presence with us by your spirit, and we bring you all the glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin to look at these seven verses, that are before us in second Timothy or second chapter of first Timothy, we will find the answer to the question, why pray? Why pray? As was mentioned, we can come up with all sorts of reasons or excuses for not for not to pray. The Apostle Paul is a representation or a represent rep represent representative of the teaching throughout the Bible concerning prayer. Another mouthful of marbles today. Folks, the people of God pray. As R.C. has reminded us, prayer is a, as essential to the believer as breathing is to life. Any student of the Bible should understand that prayerlessness is symptomatic that something has gone sideways in our lives. One time the Apostle Paul was writing from prison to the church at Philippi, like he wrote this letter in 1 Timothy in prison. And he said to the church in Philippi, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you hear the promise from God? Pray. Bring it all to God. 
and God will bring his peace, which transcends all our human understanding, and it will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Well, friends, if you think about it, in these crazy days, we so need the peace of God in our lives. Would you agree? We need sound minds in a world described by April Wine in one of their songs, The Whole World Has Gone Crazy. Well, let's spend some time in verse 1, and please notice with me this short little phrase, first of all. And all this simply means is Paul is now transitioned from the first chapter and, the, and his comments in there onto some very new things. We also see the term he uses at the beginning of this verse, I urge. This should make common sense. It applies here. There's a sense of urgency and importance here. The question is, what is important? What is urgent? To pray. This is urgent on Paul's mind and heart. And he wants the church to pray. And in case we think Paul is asking him to pray this only time, or this one time, Paul is reminding them here in this text that prayer is to be practiced often, corporately, because it will result in blessings to the church and to the believer. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul said, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Be alert and always keep praying. That's in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Moving into our text here in chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, please notice the phrase in verse 1, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Let's resist the temptation to break this down into some sort of list of different types of prayers. What's happened here is the text has opened up for us, unpacked for us, a dynamic and comprehensive view of prayer. See, whenever we approach prayer, prayer as a to-do list, as a check in the box, as something to get out of the way and move into something else, we only reveal this one thing. We don't understand what prayer is, what prayer does, and why we pray. See, God in his purpose, his will and sovereignty, has given his people this powerful, dynamic, comprehensive gift of prayer. Quite a grace that God has bestowed on his people. Next, we ask the question, who is Paul exhorting the church to pray for? Please notice, for all people. All people. God wants the people of God to pray for all people. Every single person on this planet, if you will. Kind of, kind of daunting, you think. Well, one commentator puts this this way. Quote, God desires order, peace, peace and holiness in our lives, in our worship, and in our relationships within the church, and our communities. This is what prayer does. This is what prayer is all about. Because Christian prayer is other-centered. Because Christian prayer reflects the character of God. You know, it's so easy for us to put prayer at the back of the bus. No, there's nothing wrong with riding the back of the bus. I'm just using that as an expression. When we gather for worship, think about it. Prayer is often given the rear seats. Again, there's nothing wrong with sitting in the rear seats. We just don't want to put prayer in the rear seats. We have an opening prayer, a prayer before a message, a prayer at the end of the message. And usually not much else. Paul said to the Colossian church, devote yourself to prayer. Should not the people of God, when they gather to worship God, place their full dependence and trust in God 
by prayer? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. Well, Paul went on then, here in verse 2, to be specific for who we should pray. For kings and those in authority. For those people in our communities, in our countries, who have been given the authority by God to make and keep the law of the land. And in case we don't understand this, Paul is very succinct and concise here in his letter to the Romans, chapter 13, verse 1 to 7, but I'll just read a part of that for you, where he said, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. For they are, Paul would go on to say, God's servants, God's agents. Why pray? Well, Paul was adamant that the church in Ephesus, Ephesus pray that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. Friends, not only is prayer key to our worship of God, it is commanded and required for others as well. It seems to me that the evangelical church today, at times or maybe often, is anything but peaceful and quiet. Local churches, believers, and sometimes even denominations have become more and more political. The Bible commands a church to pray for the national and local government leaders, no matter our political stripes, our affiliations, our opinions. Yes, even if our leaders are like those who were in power during the writing of this letter. And who was that? That was Nero. And if you know anything about the Emperor Nero during Paul's day, he wasn't a nice guy. And that's under, an understatement. He was, the, he was uh, profane, and he used uh, Christians eventually in the city of Rome to excuse his behavior by burning them at the stake. But Paul is clear here that our prayers are not for our comfort and maybe and not always for our not maybe not always for our safety but our prayers are a manifestation of what God has done in us the godliness and holiness God has created in us why pray verse 3 because this is good and pleases God our savior See, folks, when we make prayer a priority in our lives, in our churches, it is good. That's what the text tells us. When we pray for all people, for kings and those in authority, and we live a peaceful and quiet lives, which is the result of a transformed life by the gospel, a transformed life that displays godliness and holiness, the Bible tells us it is good, and that this pleases God, our Savior. See, God is glorified when our transformed lives please him. God is always the one that gets all the glory for he's done all, all of it for us. God, and God will use our transformed lives to do what? Verse 4. Because he will use our lives because he wants, the text tells us, all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So let's pull up a stump, sit by the fire, and sit a while on verse 4. Can I ask you a question about the Apostle Paul? You can do this for yourself. It's a test of, for your own knowledge of Apostle Paul. What was his motivation to go from here and there and everywhere, be persecuted, beaten, starved, etc., etc.? What was his motivation? Well, he said to the Philippian church, and we get his motivation quite clear here. I want to know Christ. Paul said, I want to know Christ. He has to know the power of his resurrection, resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. As we think about our culture today, and as we think about the Christian culture today, specifically the Christian culture here in the West, the first world, 
We'll pick on North America, Canada, and the United States to be more specific, and some other places in the world for sure. Australia, lots of different places. You will hear from those platforms, from some of those popular preachers and teachers of our day, pontificating that God wants you and me to have our best life now. That's right. They want you to know that God wants you to have your best life now. That God wants to bless your finances, your health, your business, everything. And God wants to release the potential within you. You'll hear this preached from these platforms, from their teachings, from their books, from everything. These teachers take Bible verses from their context to fit their message. To make it all about your best life now, your health, your wealth, your potential, your destiny, your success. When they are asked about repentance and suffering and dying to self and sacrifice and sin and forgiveness, the cross, salvation, the response often is, that's not what I do. Others do that. People are already beaten down. They need to hear something uplifting and encouraging. So they go on and on and say things like, you are valuable to God. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be rich and successful. Paul, writing to Corinthian church, said to them, I have been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open ocean. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Take my word, if you can, that Paul is not bragging here. According to Open Doors, on their watch list, 360 million Christians face severe persecution today in the world. Does God want your best life now? I wonder how Paul would answer that question. Or the 360 million Christians facing severe persecution. Paul said to Timothy, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel. By the power of God, he saved us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What does God want? What does God want for you? He wants a holy life. As we look at the last few verses, verse 5 to 7, we find here that Paul through Timothy has exhorted or is exhorted or exhorted the Ephesian church to go back to the basics. Back to the basics. For the false teachers and their teachings had distorted the gospel in Ephesus, caused some even to shipwreck their faith, caused disorder and proper worship, division, jealousy, prayerlessness, and so much more. See, they needed to get back to the basics. Friends, we all need in these days to get back to the basics. For there is many who have had their faith, as I already mentioned, shipwrecked. There's plenty of disorder and carnal worship today and division and jealousy and prayerlessness and saying things about God that aren't true about God. Lying about God. So much of that is in the church of Christ today. Paul presents you and me with Christianity 101 here in these two verses, verse 5 and 6. Paul said, there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. There is...
is much to do with these two verses, but I'm going to keep it simple, sweetie, for today. See, in our present Christian culture, not unlike the Ephesian church, objective truth, objective truth has been found wanting. In part, this is a result of our postmodern era, yet the burden is never on the culture, but on the preachers and teachers and believers who give lip service to the Bible in their desire to produce an over-the-top spiritual experience. Or selling these, and propagating these lies that God wants your best life now. Negating the Holy Bible has only one possible consequence, folks. You will fill the churches with people that think they are saved without realizing that their preachers and teachers and leaders are simply feeding their sinful desires, selling them a false gospel, filling them with false hope. And unless they believe the true gospel of Jesus Christ, they are indeed living their best life now, because the next one is going to be one hell of an experience. Here in these two verses, we find the essential truth of Christianity. Paul knew that the Ephesian church needed to hear the truth of the gospel in order to deal with all their problems and the people that were leading them astray. And what is the truth of the gospel? Well, folks, simply this. There is one holy and just God, and everyone is born with a sinful nature. A nature that desires to be satisfied by any means and independent of its creator. Simply put, we all desire to proclaim, I am the captain of my destiny, the author of my life, and I don't need you, God. Self-centered, selfish, greedy, uncaring, lying, perverted, and on and on we could go, which describes the heart without God, without hope, and only deserving, and hear this clear, the holy and just wrath of God. If it wasn't for these two words, there would be no hope, but God, but God. But God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son. And I'm conflating two verses here. But God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son, the mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus, who being found in appearance as a man, humbled himself and gave himself as a ransom for all people. Please hear me, dear ones. Your best life is yet to come. You will not find it in this present time, in this world, even if you lived a million years. In the meantime, in the between time, the people of God pray for all people. The people of God pray for kings and all those in authority. The people of God pray that God would grant repentance and salvation to all as God so desires. Because this is, as Paul put it, the proper time to tell the truth. For our friends, our world desperately needs to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your good news. We thank you for two words, but God. Even when we were running a hundred million miles the other direction, but God. And we thank you, Lord. We pray for those who have, have gained the, the voice to teach lies about you. We pray for them, Lord. We don't hate them. We pray, God, that you would bring repentance to their hearts. And that they would do the right thing once they repented. They would shut those things down. Because they are not equipped, nor are they authorized to preach anything about you, Lord. Father, we thank you that it's not me or someone else, but it is your spirit that teaches us and molds us and shapes us to be like your son, Jesus. And we give you all praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you for inviting me again into your homes. God bless you and keep you. Shalom.